What you know, Joe? I don't know nothing. What you know, Joe? Tell me something. So, um, how many, how, how much time did you spend on that show and what did you do? Knott's Landing? Yeah. I was the associate producer on the pilot and the producer of the first three years of the show. And in the fourth year, I wrote and directed a half a dozen episodes. Wow. Yeah. And how many cameras on a, on a show, like a, a show like that? How many cameras? One. It was 35 millimeter in those days. So Knott's Landing was one camera? A single camera show. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the cul-de-sac was up um, above Knollwood Country Club. And the interiors, all those houses, were on the stages at MGM. Wow. So I just think, you know, we've been hearing so much about Desi Lu and all that. Like a giant hit show like that with one camera kind of yeah, shocks yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Same thing with Dallas. Really? That's 35 millimeter. Wow. You got to figure, you know, one of the amazing things about the virtual world is you could turn your camera on at 7 a.m. and turn it off at 7 p.m. And if by that time your editor hasn't killed himself or herself, um, you can do that. Mm -hmm. When it came to 35 millimeter, you couldn't just burn film. Raw stock was expensive. Processing, Processing was expensive. They didn't just throw it on a computer to edit it. They worked with these. I can remember. <laughs> I don't know if your audience can see. I don't know if we're being Yeah, I can see. This was us looking at. Oh, yeah. Work out, prep. Out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at the, so it was a different uh, different way of going. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. So Knott's Landing was a spinoff of Dallas. Is that right? Um, that's the way it aired. <coughs> Excuse me. But when Mike Fileman and David Jacobs went to CBS, they went in to pitch Knott's Landing. The concept of Knott's Landing was an American scenes from a marriage times four set in a Southern Cal called California cul-de-sac community. Scenes from a Marriage was a very successful Ingmar Bergman film. Mm -hmm. When they got to CBS, CBS said, yeah, we love it, we love you, but we're thinking big and brassy and rich and, you know, um, and, and, you know, big money, like oil. And then somebody said, oh, you mean like Dallas? Yes, Dallas, right? And out they, they went in to sell Knott's Landing and they come out having sold Dallas. So Knott's became the Dallas spinoff instead of the other way around. Wow. Yeah. So it existed before Dallas. As a somebody's concept. On paper. On paper. Wow. Yeah. Or as a concept. Yeah. And the difference between the two, one of the great advantages of Dallas, because they didn't have a cast yet, they didn't have, the, you know, there were no limits. Because the whole thing about bigger than life meant you could do anything and go anywhere. Knott's Landing was a very middle class show. You could only push the walls so far. So, for example, I always thought that Michelle Lee should run for office in, as Karen Fairgate. And David, who was really, really talented and really a good guy and really astute, said uh, the audience won't relate to a middle class woman running for office. And in 1980, that was probably true. Wow. So, and were you guys uh, surprised at the success? I think so, because the original, I, I can see it on his refrigerator. One of the first uh, reviews David got on Dallas excoriated it. It's mindless, it's popcorn, it's deadly, it's blah, 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 right? About five or six years go by, it's the biggest thing in television, and the, and the guy had to re-review it. He says, I was wrong. <laughs> because... Um, I think people like to know that rich people have screwed up lives too. You know, you say money can't buy happiness. Well, it can't buy civility, fidelity, loyalty. You know, they were such a mess. But interestingly, Jay, uh, sometimes characters emerge, like the Fonz in yeah. Happy Days. Yeah. Well, it was really going to be Bobby who was going to be the focal point. But Larry Hagman, Jr. was so much bigger than life. Yeah, you got to uh, follow the audience. You got to follow what follow, the audience that's, leans that's right, into. That's right. That's right. You dance with who brung you, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, we're gonna make a book, by the way, of all your little uh, Joeisms. Joeisms. Uh, yeah. There's a whole chapter in the back of my <laughs> upcoming book called <laughs> "Quotes from." This Joe. isn't for the, for the purposes of plugging, so don't plug anything here. Oh, right? I can't forget I said that. Yeah. <laughs> 
One of the fir when I first became a, a production assistant and, and then a second second assistant got into the director's guild, one of the first jobs I did, a guy named Marty, a sound technician, took me aside and he said, Joe, in your career, learn to hear before you see. He says, when you go on a tech scout, the DP's looking at the shots and the angles. Set dress is looking at the, the drapes and the c carpet, right? The, the grips are looking at where they, do they have enough space for a dolly. Separate yourself from that and go listen. Is there an echo? Do you hear children? Can you hear the freeway? Can you hear helicopters? It's because as sound goes, so goes your location. Okay, I'm 22, 23. I file it. Okay, I file it. But I did get to do it. It became part of my mental urge. Every time I went to a location, I tended to, to listen. Cut to many years ago by 1987, I get hired to do a show in New Mexico called Independence. It's a Western. Actually starred John, uh, Matthew Perry's father, John oh, wow. Barrett Perry. And a guy named Gordy Dawson, really good writer of uh, Westerns. So we go up to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and we're shooting this thing. And uh, first of all, I'm from Brooklyn. I'm a kid from Brooklyn. To be laying a along the Rio Grande with real cowboys eating total tamale. Fit. I mean, it total. I was like, <laughs> I can't. Somebody take a picture. Um, so we're shooting in these canyons. There's this big open field. And there are two paths to this camp. One's kind of wide and easily accessible. And the other follows a river, a dry riverbed. And the walls are steeper and it's windy. So the only way I could go back and forth between the we were shooting in one and prepping the other was on horseback. So here I am, kid from Brooklyn, hanging out with Cowboy. Now I got my own horse. And, and his name was? You know, I don't remember. Or uh, her name. I'm sorry. I don't remember. But I do remember mercifully that it wasn't some didn't think Crazy it was running fire. in the Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we would amble up one thing so we're shooting and there's this big wide open field and I'm watching they're taking the equipment up the wider canyon, but they're also starting to prep in the narrow one. All right, so they're shooting in the bigger one and I would go back and forth on horseback, but now it's about two o'clock in the afternoon and uh, my horse is getting restless. I don't know why, it hasn't been that way. Uh, they're finished in the wide canyon and they're going up into the narrow one. And I start to hear a sound I can't identify. It would bother me. I think it was like a low rumble. Hmm. I think looking up, there's no contrails. It's not a plane. The earth isn't moving. It's not an earthquake. But I look way over and the clouds are forming. So I think to myself, okay, well, we probably got about an hour before we're going to get rained on. So now they finished the uh, wide canyon and they're all in the narrow one. And the clouds get closer, sorry. That's okay, you can bring it back up. The clouds get closer and the rumble gets louder. And then it starts to rain, just a little bit. But I'm thinking, this can't be good. So I go into the narrow canyon, and by the time I get in there, that little drizzle was getting to be a downpour. And I realized that the sound I was hearing was a flash flood coming down that canyon. And I went, suddenly, you know, I'm Dale Evans on that horse going full tilt. Well, Roy Rogers, try to be politically correct. Um, uh, and I'm yelling, cut, you guys got to get out, get out, rap, rap, rap. And, they, and nobody's paying any attention because what producer in his right mind tries Listen to Listen to a PA. Or, yeah, well, by that Anybody, time I was a producer. Yeah. But now it's really coming down. And sure enough, there's a trickle of water in this dry bed. And suddenly... And the nexus hits everybody. You guys wrap and get out of here. Leave the equipment. Just go. And they book. They're running. Some did carry equipment. Some didn't. John Bennett Perry was on a horse. He took off. Now I'm standing there thinking, you know, you're the captain of the ship. You can't be the first one out. And I'm thinking, I hope these guys <laughs> pick up the pace a little bit. And they did. They hauled ass. And, and as I was leaving, here comes this water. And now, kid from Brooklyn. Gatorade with cowboys, and I'm running for my life on this horse. And we made it out of the canyon, and I got up to a, a, a like a little rise off on the right. Grip stands floating by, boxes floating by. 
but nobody got hurt. Wow. And I sat there thinking, God bless you, Marty. Uh, okay, I have one more for you. Ready? Yep. That is Dallas. That is Dallas. <laughs> yes. Um, and so what was your, what, how long, what was your role on that show? Well, I wasn't involved with the series. Mm -hmm. um, my phone rings one day, David Jacobs. I should back up and say David Jacobs, phenomenal guy, incredibly talented, one of the best writers of women in Hollywood in my estimation, and a lot of fun. He was great. Um, he calls me one day. He says, Joe, have lunch with me. I said, sure. We go to the Hamburger Hamlet, he says, uh, on La Siena. Yeah, yeah. And he says, uh, you got to help me. I wrote a script. It's the prequel to the series. It's called Dallas, the Early Years. But Lee Rich, who was head of Lorimar, it's budgeted right now at $8 million, and he won't do it for $8 million. He wants no more than five, five and a half million, and he wants me to rewrite it. He says, Joe, I don't want to rewrite it. I said, okay. Well, so we're eating and we're talking, and, and he happened to let slip that the direct, not let slip, and tell me that the, uh, the director, Larry Ellican, was on a pay a play deal. They were going to pay him 150000 whether he, they did it or not. So, what year? Oh, gosh, 1982 or, or something like that. I don't even remember. It's yes. quite a bit of money. For some, yeah, in those days, yeah. quite a bit of money. And I mean, it's it, not nothing to sneeze at now, but for, right. for a position like that, that's a lot of money. In those days, yeah. yeah. And it was um, pay or play, which meant he, if we never did it, some did come 30 days, 90 days, Larry, did somebody cut him a check. So it was good information. So fortunately for me, the head of Lorimar Production was a guy named Eddie Denault of physical production, kind of my job at USC. Um, and Eddie liked me. Because when I did series for them, he said, uh, I have six shows, and if Joe is on one of them, that's one show I don't have to worry about. So I had a credibility cachet with Eddie. I just called him. I said, hey, look, you're on the hook for 150000 Put up 5000 send me, Larry, and the art director, the head of the art department down to Texas. Let us see. I mean, I, I don't know why. Well, I did know why, because in the script, they were, the, all, they were going to build all these oil rigs and because it was a studio budget, it, they thought in terms of studio labor. So they were going to build oil rigs at $54,000 a pop. And the common wisdom, if you didn't really break it down, just look at the script, was they needed a dozen. So, you know, you got $600,000 worth of oil rigs. To his credit, Eddie said, sure. So the three of us, Larry, myself, and the hut, go down to Texas. And uh, we weren't an hour out of the airport when we came to a museum, an oil museum. And we were talking to the guy, and I'd say, well, you know, all these oil rigs must be expensive. Guy says, I can build you one for $1,100. <laughs> I said, really? <laughs> he said, yeah, it's going to be pipe and wood, and, but it, it's going to look the same. You know, it's, I said, hold that thought. So we, then we go out to the field where we were going to uh, shoot the oil and put up the oil rigs, big field in McKinney, Texas. And uh, the art director says to Larry, what's your shot? And um, I had worked with Larry before. I knew no matter what Larry said, he had no clue what his shot was going to be, no clue what Lindsay was going to be on, but he would give him an answer. He said, I'm going to be over here on the 35. And, maybe, and I thought, there isn't a chance. But the art director said, look, if that's really what you're going to do, we only need three or four in front, and then I'll bring, I'll make mache or, or, you know, and smaller, and it'll look off in the distance. It's 35 millimeter. It's not, you know, not this stuff. You can see your, your gizzard. Um, it's 35 yeah. millimeter. So make a long story short, we go back to L.A. Just down in Texas, we took, I don't know, three quarters of a million dollars out of the budget. Then CBS, to their great credit, didn't go with established stars. Dale Midkiff, Grant, David Grant. I mean, nobody even heard of them in yeah. those days. So that took a lot out of the cast budget. And then is a tendency, I assume it still exists, but it was certainly true then, that post-production always over-budgeted because they didn't want to get blamed if some... Because it's always easier to take money out than it is to ask for. If you ask for it, it's like you've killed their dog, right? But if you take it out, you're a hero. 
So they had over budget. Long story short, we get greenlit at five and a half million. So off we go and we make Dallas the early years. In those days, when it aired, it got a 36 share. Mm. To show you how the business changed when I did 7th Heaven, we were a hit with a seven share. 36. Wow. If I had a 36 today, they'd name the network after me. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there were only three networks, and there were four yeah. maybe in yeah. those days. So yeah. that's how. Yeah. It's interesting with some of these shows too, because they really did make. They were like st star nurseries, right? They were creating stars, you know. Well, um, when I worked at Spelling, that was especially true. He, Aaron Spelling had an instinct for performers that was like nothing I've ever seen anywhere else. When I came to California, I used to play softball in Barrington Park with mm -hmm. Aaron. He was an out-of-work writer. Ten years later, I was working for him. He was worth a billion dollars. Yeah, you Jesus. Know. Good country, America. <laughs> I hope I go there someday. <laughs> I hope I can afford it. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Who is We were talking about Connie Selica. And oh, yeah. she, she, she was on Falcon Crest? No, Hotel. When I hotel. worked there, she was on Hotel. Okay, well, let's find that theme song because I don't even know. I don't think that was a show. I know of that show. It's not really a show I watched. Um, Henry, Henry Mancini, really? <laughs> Probably, yeah. I don't remember. Well, well there was a two-hour movie, Hotel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's cool. And uh, what, um, uh, what, what's your connection to that show? Um, I was hired to produce it. <clears throat> when I left Knott's Landing, I was going over to Hotel, and the writers, who were the, also the producers, said to me, you realize, Joe, when you leave Knott's, when you left Knott's, that's the last time you'll ever be the sole producer on a show? And I didn't really register, you know, because I had, had so much leeway. I mean, look, I had great executive. I love Mike Fileman, God bless him. I love David Jacobs, God bless him. But they didn't think they were producers. I was there because they weren't producers. And so I really felt appreciated. I felt, felt I contributed. Um, when I went over to the hotel, I still felt I contributed, but I wasn't the sole producer. Mm-hmm. And because it was spelling, the writing producers had a lot of sway, which is fine. Um, but spelling, uh, especially Duke Vincent, were very production savvy and very production friendly. So they wanted somebody. They didn't, you know, they didn't want the writers making it so expensive that they couldn't, you know. Everybody, we I think we once talked about it. If if you lend your car to a show, you want the producing credit, yeah. right? Well. The problem with too many producers on a show is they all think they can produce. So it's cumbersome. You have to, you know, anyway. Uh, but that's the way the industry changed, so I had to adapt. Um, but I loved the cast on Hotel, and they loved me. They were good kids. They were fun. They were excited. They were on an Aaron Spelling show. It was a hit. It was a nice place to be. Mm -hmm. One of the things I remember is that we had a standing set on Warner Brothers, and the cinematographer was an all-time guy named Arch Dalzell. We literally had 110 Ks up in the rafters, and if we turned them on at the hall, we'd get a call from Burbank saying, could you guys turn that down? We're having a brownout here in Burbank. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's crazy. You know, you don't light like that anymore. I mean, wow. it's like lighting the sun. Yeah. So we would go to Archie and say, Archie, can you do it with like 80 lights or 60 <laughs> lights? So that people in Burbank can have dinner, you know. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's funny. And so, um, and that was supposed to be where? New York? No, San Francisco. San Francisco. It was, I, the, I think they shot the pilot in the St. Francis. Mm -hmm. And then we replicated the lobby. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, a, a, a show like that is like any detective show. The show depends on who walks through the door. Right. Except in hotel, you have visiting dignitaries and people there, you know, on vacation. Yeah. I mean, so that would generate the stories. Yeah, yeah. But I remember Shari Belafonte, Harry Belafonte's yeah. daughter or granddaughter, and Michael. And they're just good kids. A couple of the actors fell in love and got married and are still married. 
Uh, Connie was on the show. Connie was terrific. Mm -hmm. Ann Baxter. What I remember about right. Ann, Ann Baxter, um, in those days, women tended to take longer than men to get through makeup and hair because yeah. of the hair. And the, right? So a, a director comes to me one day and he says, I have one shot that I got to get, but we have a whole day of shooting tomorrow. So you have to get Miss Baxter in here for that first shot. So we set Ann Baxter. She comes in at six in the six in the morning. She goes into makeup and hair. She's in there for an hour and a half. She comes out, looks fabulous. As she's walking towards me, the director says, "I think I'm going to cut that shot." <laughs> I, I, you know, it's like I. I said, uh, Miss Baxter, I don't know how to tell you this. She says, but I think they're going to scrap that shot. She takes my face in her hand and she squeezes me. She says, okay, Joe, don't worry. I'm going shopping. <laughs> she paid for, they, you paid for a makeover. You made for a makeover. I'm going shopping. <laughs> oh, so she was, she was really great. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, okay, we'll do one more. <laughs> you make me think of a lot of stuff. Well, it's kind of a get, dead giveaway uh, if, yeah, if, uh, if yeah. the lyrics are the title of the show. <laughs> there's not a lot of mystery I, there. I, I actually didn't remember that. Um, Catherine Hicks. Yeah. Barry Wilson. Watson. Jessica, Jessica Beale. Jessica Beale is the big Stephen takeaway Collins. from that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. I hear she married a singer or something. I'm not really sure. Yeah, that's what I heard. Um uh, and then t t tell me about your association with that show. What'd you do? Producer. Your producer. Yeah. For how long? I did the first two years. Mm -hmm. What would happen with, first of all, I get very restless. I can't do, I, you know, that's why what's so phenomenal that I've been at USC all this time. Um, I was really good at coming on, setting up a show, setting the look, the style, getting everything in place. And then by year three, it's boring. Pattern, it, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's the same thing. It's a little bit like being a professor. Yeah. Go through the semester and then you start off. It's like a little bit like a mouse on a treadmill. Yeah. So, um, but what I was very good at and what I, I get shows started and they'd be uh, financially successful. We used to shoot at the church right on the corner of um, Riverside and Colfax in the Valley. It's mm -hmm. a big church there. Great location. And the guy, with the pastor, Dr. Robert Bach, he was very good to us. And uh, that worked. Of course, we ran afoul of at night with some of the neighbors because yeah. of the trucks, yeah. the noise, yeah. you know. Yeah. But that was, uh, spelling shows were very well mounted because they really uh, respected, especially Duke Vincent, respect, respected producing. They understood production. They respected it. They, you know, they would spend the money in the right places. Yeah. But they, uh, I remember a day when the director, one of my directors fell in love with a beach house, bright blue beach house. Very pretty, wanted to shoot it. How much was it? 60000 a day. A little pricey for a location in those days. But the problem was it was the MTV house. Oh, yeah. And I was very leery of the way yeah. MTV shows worked. So... Um, I went to the director. I said, "Look, man, you got to find another location because I don't think sixty thousand is the end of it." And when I went to scout it, and I saw the kids in the house, I thought, uh, "No, no, just street instinct." It, I wouldn't get what I was told I would get. Things would change. Things would. So I, uh, the, but the director really wanted it. So I went to Duke. I said, "Look, I tell you the truth, I wouldn't do it." Now, you guys want to do it? Have at it. But I don't want to wear it when 60 becomes 80. So Duke said, tell him if he wants it, he's got to take 60000 out of some other part of the show. Hmm. Well, he couldn't do it. So he had to give it up. Hmm. So they were good at trade. They didn't want to tell directors no. That you, you couldn't. Spelling would say to me, this show is going to cost $60 million. I want it great. And I don't want it for $60 million and $10. So, you know, it, there was no ambiguity. Hard parameters. Hard parameters. Ah. Uh.